Hey everybody, so I'm once again at Francis Marion's grave site because for some reason that video that I did a couple of years ago has really been picking up in popularity so I decided I'd come back and redo it and hopefully do it better this time than what I did last time. So if you'd like to watch again, come on and join me and I'm going to show you around. So this is, this is Francis Marion's grave. Francis Marion died February 27th, 1795 in his 63rd year and was buried here at Bell Island Plantation, home of his brother Gabriel. His own plantation, Pond Bluff, was about 15 miles upriver and is now under Lake Marion. He was born in South Carolina, the descendant of French Huguenot immigrants. The exact date and place of his birth are unknown. And this over here says all rich in iodine. So just in case you don't know, South Carolina was once known as the iodine state. I looked it up, it was from 1930 to 1935, it was the iodine state because um, the ground was rich in iodine for the vegetation and stuff. So somebody asked that question the other day on my other video why I did not cover that. So that is the answer to that. Anyway, this says um, Bell Island Plantation, the former home of Gabriel Marion, brother of General Francis Marion. The latter is buried there in the family graveyard, one mile. So one mile from this destination is where he's at. And up here it says erected in 1931 by the South Carolina Daughters of the American Revolution and citizens of Charleston and Berkeley counties. And this says Bell Isle Plantation, burial place of General Francis Marion the Swamp Fox, famous partisan warrior of the American Revolution, a native of Berkeley County, South Carolina, born 1732, died 1795. Our band is few, but true and tried, our leader frank and bold. The British soldier trembles when Marion's name is told, and that's by Bryant. So this is drive back here. Last time I did not show the drive, but this time I'm gonna go ahead and show the drive back here, just in case anybody's interested. This is how it looks going back.
So whenever you get out, you see this marker right here. And this is the same thing that's up there at the road whenever you first come in. And this talks about the Lusa Francis Marion guerrilla commander. Disastrous American defeats during the Revolutionary War. Charleston and Camden in the summer of 1780 led many South Carolinians to give up the fight for independence. But Francis Marion carried on the struggle, waging a guerrilla war in the forests and swamps of the Low Country with a varying number of poorly equipped volunteer soldiers. For more than two years, Marion and his brigade attacked enemy columns, captured isolated outposts, and fought along regular American forces in pinched, pitched battles. His stubborn resistance to the British helped secure victory. His generous treatment of former loyalists after the bitter war helped endure peace. I don't know how good this is going to show up because it's a bright, sunshiny day today. And this says, no contemporary artist ever painted a portrait of Marion, but this 19th century engraving comes close to description written by William James, a teenage soldier in his brigade. And it says, he was rather below the middle statue of men, lean and swarthy. His body was well set, but his knees and ankles were badly formed, and he still limped upon one leg. He had a countenance remarkably steady. His nose was aquiline his chin projecting his forehead large and high and his eyes black and piercing he was now 48 years of age but still even at this age his frame was capable of enduring fatigue and every provision necessary for a partisan and that's all the battles right there and then over here this wayside it says the loose of francis marrying the stuff of legend for what he did in less than three years during the Revolutionary War, Francis Marion Warren won enduring fame. By the 19th century, he was remembered as a swamp fox, the partisan commander who always eluded the British and their loyal loyalist allies. Marion's achievements are significant and real, but some of his fame rests upon exaggerated stories in a biography by Mason Weems, the biographer of George Washington who fabricated the famous story of Washington chopping down a cherry tree. Much about Marion remains unknown, and the Swamp Fox, obscured by legend, is almost elusive to history as he was to the British. So we have this right here. And this. So it says, Fallen trees destroyed Marion's marble tombstone pictured at right, prompting calls for funds to replace it. In 1893, the state responded by erecting the existing granite monument over the remains of the original marker. And this shows that the South Carolina State Park Service also helps take care of this. So now we're getting back here. It says 1931, General Francis Marion and his wife rest within this enclosure erected in gratitude and appreciation of the services of the Swamp Fox during the American Revolution by the Daughters of the American Revolution of South Carolina in 1931. So we're going to go on in. And this is his wife's grave here. Some Mary Esther Marion. And I love that someone put flowers on her grave. It says, sacred to the memory of the deceased, is erected by desire of the late Keating Lewis Simmons, 
as directed in his will in testimony of his gratitude, friendship, and affection for her. Such a nice jester. And this over here, this is Francis Marion's tomb. It says, sacred to the memory of General Francis Marion, who departed this life on the 27th of February, 1795, in the 63rd year of his age. Deeply regretted by all his fellow citizens. History will record his worth and rising generations. Embalm his memory as one of the most distinguished patriots and heroes of the American Revolution, which elevated his native country to honor and independence and secured to her the blessings of liberty and peace this tribute of veneration and gratitude is erected by oh well erected in commemoration of the more in i can't even read that so far away something another virtues of the citizen of the calent Exploits so of the soldier who lived fear, live without fear, and died without reproach. One of these days, I'm gonna be able to see really good, but apparently, today is not the day either. And this is to preserve to posterity this burial place of an honored son. The General Assembly of South Carolina replaces the crumbling and broken tomb nearly a century old with this enduring memorial cut from her own granite hills. So that's, that's really nice. So this might be a better look. I'm trying not to get the sun glaring in it too much. Because there's not a cloud in the sky today. Out here. So anyway, they have their tombs, you know, inside a really nice gate and everything. But there are other markers back here as well. Now there is Theodore Samuel Marion departed this life on the 7th of something other in 1897 maybe age 63 years and that's sacred to the memory of Emma daughter of Theodore S and Jane S DuBose who died on the 1st of August in 1833 aged 11 months and a few days that's so sad it's always sad when it was a child I always find that one interesting. That looks like a sleigh almost. So this one says, the markers of person's name below were removed from the Trinity Church, Black Oak. The remains rest in the original grave covered by a cement slab. And all those names on there, they're where they were originally laid to rest. And this is Gabriella DeVoe, widow of Richard Clemens, born September 12, 1816, died June 29, 1908. And that's George Porcher, son of Dr. John P. and Anna F. Porcher, born at Cedar Spring Plantation, St. John's, Berkeley, March 12, 1839, died in Charleston on November 13, 1859. So he was relatively young also. Was Anna, born 
February 22nd, 1864, died October 5th, 1864. That was George, born February 9th, 1862, died September 2nd, 1866, possibly. This is Kate C. Porcher. Born August 28, 1839, died August 11, 1923, till the day of Christ, wife of John P. Porcher. So she lived a long time. Oh, this one, pretty one right here. Mary's Elizabeth Ann Brown, wife of Reverend Manning Brown and daughter of S.G. and A.B. DeVoe. Born March 8, 1825, died December 19, 1860. That's really pretty. And this one is in memory of Anne, daughter of Francis Payne, and wife of S.G. And I may not be pronouncing that right, but that's just how I'm going to pronounce it. Died December 23rd. Well, no, not December. Died the 23rd of April in 1823, aged 28 years. So that's young. I don't know. You can get that out. So it says, beneath this stone is the remains of Robert Marion DeVoe, oldest child of Stephen and Anne. Ooh, this one killed me today. Sacred to the memory of Stephen, who died 6th of September, 1850, aged 63 years. This one says, may angels guard the slumbering dust until judgment day. That's sacred to the memory of Ms. Elizabeth DeBose, wife of Samuel DeBose Jr., who departed this life on the 16th day of June 1809, aged 21 years and one month. And this is Annie, daughter of R.H. and A. Born December 2nd, 1862, died December 30th, 1868. I can't read the first name on that one because it's already smashed off. But it was a wife of Herbert Scriven. And she was born July 18, 1841 and died February 4th, 1868. So all these people were really young except for a couple of them whenever they passed away. So there are two dates also inscribed on this tomb right here. On this side over here it says 1893 and then whenever you come over to the front of it it says 1795. So I don't think I covered that a few minutes ago whenever I was actually inside of there but that's what those say. I gotta get my shades on. It's, it's bright out here again. Anyway, I think I'm going to go a few more places and show a little bit more about Francis Marion before I wrap up this video. So, we're going to see where it takes me. I know where one of the spots is going to take me, so I've just got to go there. Anyway, just hold on a few seconds and we'll be at the next destination. All right, before I go, I just did see a thing on the back side of this sign up here at the front, so I've got to cover that before I show you where I'm heading next. So, just give me a brief moment. 
So the thing on this side before we leave the burial site says South Carolina Francis Marion, Brigadier General of the South Carolina Militia during the American Revolution. Francis Marion was one of the partisan leaders who kept the war alive during the British occupation of the state. His elusive disappearance after surprise attack against superior forces harassed and demoralized the enemy, earning for him the name Swamp Fox. Okay, so now we have made it to Johnsonville, South Carolina, and this is where they have the sculpture of Francis Marion. So I decided since we went to the grave site, we might as well come here so you can see this as well. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of history about this and then we'll see what else we can get into. All right, so this is the sculpture. And it says, Francis Marion at Witherspoon's Ferry. At this place on August 17, 1780, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Marion took command of the Williamsburg Militia, one of the few remaining American fighting forces opposing the British in South Carolina. For the remainder of 1780 and in 1781, this brigade led by Marion and augmented by militia from the areas surrounding the PD, Santee, and Black Rivers would keep the cause of American liberty alive in South Carolina and would ultimately play a prominent role in the achievement of the American River. American independence. In the late March of 1781, elements of Marion's Brigade engaged British troops that were crossing Lynch's River here as they retreated from the destruction of Marion's camp at Snows Island. Citizen soldiers, both black and white, rode forth from where you stand to fight for the rights and ideals that define the American nation. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. So I'm going to go over here and see what this says. So this says Witherspoon's Ferry. Francis Marion takes command. Then late in the summer of 1780, Major General Horatio Gates led a Continental Army towards South Carolina to attempt to roll back the British conquest of the province. As Gates prepared to meet the British at Camden, he sent Colonel Francis Marion, a Continental officer who had only escaped the fall of Charleston because of a broken ankle, south towards the Santee River to gather the local militia forces and prevent a British retreat. On August 17, 1780, leading a ragtag band of fewer than 20 men, some white, some black, and all mounted, but most of them miserably equipped, Colonel Marion entered the camp of the Williamsburg Militia here at Witherspoon's Ferry, probably a site a few yards downstream just ahead of you, and took command. William Dubain James, then a 15-year-old militiaman, recalled his first sight of Marion. And I think that's pretty much what I read at um, his gravesite right there. So there's like really great detail on that sculpture up there. I can't remember how long it's been here. It's been here a few years now. It wasn't always here, but it's been here for now. Probably at least 10 years, maybe. I think that bird has just decided it. Francis Marion's hand is just a beautiful place to perch. It's already came up there a few times, but then it just landed back again so I could put it in the video, I guess. So this way side talks about South Carolina's revolutionary rivers. And the South Carolina Revolutionary Rivers Trail highlights the American Revolution Southern Campaign and in particular General Francis Marion the Swamp Fox. 
designated a national recreation trail in 2014 the 66 miles of river offer paddlers a captivating experience of floating through swamp land that was once traversed by patriots engaged in guerrilla warfare against the loyalists short excursions and overnight rustic camping opportunities are numerous and this over here tells about general francis marion it says in Late summer 1780, General Francis Marion took command of the poorly organized Williamsburg and Britain's Neck militias at Witherspoon's Ferry, now called Venture's Landing. And it says in late 1779 and early 1780, British mili mili military, somebody's nearby, I don't want to think I'm just talking to myself, planners implemented a new strategy to retake the rebellious north american colonies but by the fall of 1780 the british realized that their hold on south carolina was far from secure along the pd and santee rivers francis marion a continental officer who had escaped the fall of charleston by chance revived the patriot militias and began attacking british supply and communication lines with a band of fighters that reflected the ethnic and religious diversity of the province including native americans english ulster scots french huguenots free and enslaved africans and mixed race people marion pioneered a guerrilla warfare that took advantage of the heavily forested wetland terrain of the low country vastly outmanned and outgunned marion and other patriot militia leaders constantly harassed the british and Louis forces in a series of small engagements by denying the british total victory in south carolina marion's militia helped turn the tide of the war in favor of independence so according to the google maps this is snow island out here but as you can see the road is barricaded and everything so we're not going any further because it said the road ended so we're still on the actual road right now but we're not going any further so you'll just have to imagine how it looked Okay, so here's another sign. It said, South Carolina Marion at Ports Ferry. Ports Ferry, three miles northeast on the PD, was owned and operated by Francis Port, who lived from 1725 to 1812, widow of Thomas Port, who was a member of the Provincial Congress from Prince Frederick's Parish. This was a strategic crossing for Francis Marion, who fortified and used it frequently in his small campaign of 1780 against Britain and Tories. And then on this side over here, it says Asbury at Ports Ferry. During his journeys in South Carolina from 1801 on, Methodist Bishop Francis Asbury often used the ferry and stayed at the homes of friends nearby. In 1811, the year before Francis Port's death, Asbury founded, no, found Mother Port Keeping House at 87. His last crossing was in January 1816, a few weeks before his own death. Okay, so now I'm in Britain's Neck, South Carolina, and it's actually in Marion County, so that's appropriately named. And I'm at the marker right here, so I'm going to flip the camera around and read it what it says. So this says Marion's Camp at Snow's Island. During the American Revolution, General Francis Marion, 1732 to 1795, the most successful of the Patriot Cartesian could be partisan leaders made his camp and headquarters about 1.8 miles south southwest on snow's island the island named for settlers james and william snow is bounded by the pd river lynch's river and clark's creek Marion, called the Swamp Fox, led a South Carolina militia brigade that camped on the island in the winter of 1780 through 81. In March 1781, with Marion and his men absent, loyalists under Colonel Wellborn Dole raided and destroyed the camp. Marion continued to frustrate British and loyalist, loyalist commanders until the end of the war. So that's the history on that. Yeah, according to the GPS, this is part of the Francis Marion thing, but I don't know. Okay, now I'm in Turbyville, South Carolina, looking at different Francis Marion information. They got a lot of murals around town, so we're going to go around and look at them. So this is a mural that's in Turbyville, South Carolina. This is called Puddin' Swamp of the Frontier. And a lot of these towns have murals that have to do with Francis Marion, so apparently this is one of them. Actually, it is. I see him up there in the corner. There he is up there on his horse. I see the hat. So I think the sun is gonna hit this one too bad. 
but this one is on the side of the Dollar Journal in Turberville. And this one is known as Battle of Terracote. So it says, during the American Revolution, a few miles south of Turberville, General Francis Marion and his militia rooted, routed the British. General Marion learned Colonel Tynes, with over 90 troops, was camped at the edge of Tearcoat Swamp. On October 25th, 1780, Marion moved swiftly toward Tearcoat and attacked at midnight. Marion's patriots captured food, muskets, and horses. And these are two more. These are on the old post office in Turbotville. So that's some kind of fire burning right there. And then some people moving through a swamp. And this is, says, this is the burning of Muzon's home by his friend. And it tells about Captain Henry Muzon, Muzon the second. Fantastic artwork, too. And that little face in that window almost scared me for a second. I'm like, what in the world? Is it a ghost? But I guess it was somebody looking out and they pointed at him from the yard. And there is a fox right there. So I'm gonna hop in again because I always am hopping in to make little notes. I'm not sure if that is tear coat swamp or tear coat swamp because I, I got to thinking about it. It could have been tear coat. I was calling it tear coat, but it could be tear coat. So if anybody knows, you can comment below, and I'm pretty sure that somebody out there knows the correct saying of all this. But anyway, that's some of the murals that was in Turbyville. So now we're heading on to Manning. So now I'm in Manning, South Carolina, and they have a lot of murals in this town about Francis Marion, so we're going to take a look at some of them. His name Citizen Soldier 220 years ago. This one is called Help for Marion's Militia. During the American Revolution, General Marion and his militia needed help from local farmers for food, horses, and medical care for wounds and diseases. Help for Marion's militia. And I've come to the conclusion all these things have foxes in them because that right there is a fox. is called Ambush at Bimbo's Ferry.
of course, there's yet another fox. At the traffic lights, turn right onto South Mill Street. So this is the one that's at the fire station, but they got that parking lot barricaded off now, so we cannot get into that one. So this particular one is on the side of the IGA. And this one's really pretty. that's on the Central Carolina Technical College campus. So this one is called Pond Bluff to St. Stephen's Church. After the American Revolution, General Marion's month militiamen rebuilt his home. Francis Marion at age 53 married Mary Esther Bedeau. April 20th, 1786. They lived at Pond Bluff on the south edge of the Santee River and raised pine land cattle. With Oscar, the Marians frequently traveled to formal battle sites and took Sunday day long trips to St. Stephen's Church. February 27th, 1795, Marion, age 62, died at his home, which is now under Lake Marion. He is buried at his brother's Bell Isle. So. There's the fox in that one, right there. There's also a bear hidden in this one. I just saw that whenever I was walking back. So the next one coming up is attached to the Domino's in Manon. So it's just gonna be a drive by. And that one's called Ambush at Halfway Swamp. That's what that one was called. And that one right there is called the Swamp Fox. And it is attached to the substation, too. So that one's really great. So this one is called Francis Marion Reflections. During the American Revolution, 1780, General Marion and his men and the men of his brigade pushed back the British forces in the Black and Santee River basins. It is unlikely that they thought they would be remembered by future generations. It may be that Marion never lived long enough to know he was called the Swamp Fox. Today, we appreciate the effort these brave Americans put forth to make this the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's truly nice right there. And I love that they've got the fox reflecting him right there. That is just so pretty. And then last but definitely not least, in the Clarendon County Chamber of Commerce, they have a statue down there. And then they also have another thing that you're probably going to have to go online to see because I cannot get a good shot of it. But... That is it. So as we're driving to our next location to see a 
another mural of Francis Marion. Thought you might enjoy looking at the sunset for this afternoon. And then I'll have to start the video back up again tomorrow to get the rest of the murals. And right now we're heading to Paxville, South Carolina. And that's also on the same exit that the Manning exit is. It's on um, exit 119 on I-95. And just in case you don't know where the Turbyville exit is, that's exit 135 on I-95. Okay, so now I'm in Paxville, South Carolina, and this is the only mural in this town, and it's attached to a gas station. So, let me go take a closer look at it. On that one. This is Chase at Richburg's Mill during the American Revolution, November 1780. Colonel Tarleton with his green dragon dragoons hunted General Marion. Tarleton encamped at the late General Richardson's home. Marion was warned by the widow's son and quickly withdrew to the east of Jack's Creek near Richburg Mill. Learning that General Marion had slipped away, Tarleton gave chase. Marion and his militia stayed just ahead of the dragoons and fighting a series of delaying actions rode to the head of Jack's Creek down to the Potagalogo River and slipped away to Benbow's Ferry. Okay, so now it's the next morning. Now I'm in Somerton, South Carolina, so I can wrap up all the murals. So this particular one is called Siege of Fort Watson, April 16th through the 23rd, 1781. During the American Revolution, Colonel Lee's Legion of Virginia joined General Marion's brigade along the Santee River. They laid siege to British-held Fort Watson built on top of the Santee Indian Mound. Major Mam's idea was to build a tower so that riflemen could shoot in the fort. After days of chopping saplings, they erected the tower overnight. So then on April 23rd, 1781, at dawn, firing from the tower led to rapid surrender of Fort Watson by the British. Not an easy one to take either. Well, this close. There's another one there, but it has absolutely no kind of information beside it, but it's really pretty. I don't know how good this one's going to show up because the sun's hitting it quite a good bit. But this says this is the Patriot in the red coat. 
There in the American Revolution after the fall of Charlestown in 1780, General Francis Marion's militia frequently crossed the Santee swamps and appeared at every turn near Jack's Creek in the Santee River with his men who were red, white, and black. Patriots ambushed the British and loyalists and controlled the supply routes to Camden. The Redcoats pursued and did not capture the Swamp Fox. The Patriots won independence for the colonies with the Southern Campaign. So that's probably what that one is on the other building, the Red Coat. So this one right here is called wagon travel. During the American Revolution, travel was slow and hard work. Wagons needed to stop often since wooden axles and wooden wheels required grease and maintenance. Marion's militia was documented as traveling 50 miles through the swamps at night on horseback. Most travel from Nelson's Ferry to Camden was along the Santee Path just west of here. This Patriot gives directions to Marion's camp near Jack's Creek. This one's called Patriot Departs to Ride with Marion. During the American Revolution, August 1780, General Francis Marion was ordered by General Gates to roam the Santine burning boats. Being successfully engaged in this task, he learned of Gates' defeat at Camden. This Patriot leaves his family at Scotts Lake to join Marion at nearby Nelson's Ferry. Other mounted militia join Marion on the River Road where they continue to attack British supply lines, then disappeared into nearby swamps. And so this is the very last mural that we had to find. This is the elusive Francis Marion from 1780 to 1781. During the American Revolution, General Marion's brigade eluded the British invaders. Marion's militia slipped through swamps, trees, and grasslands, enticing the British to follow and search along the Santee. In November 1780, the British sent Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton to engage Marion and his militia. General Marion looked for the British and headed towards Jack's Creek. His spy reported Tarleton at General Richardson's home. Marion's militia attempted to lure them into an ambush at Ben Bose Ferry on the Black River. The British gave up the pursuit at Ox Fox and called Marion the Swamp Fox. So, it's kind of appropriate this is the last mural that we find. You know, it brings it all together. This one's really beautiful too. It's got um, bears in it. It's got a parakeet up there. It's got a fox over there in the corner. So it's really, really nice. So now we're in Florence, South Carolina, which is the home of Francis Marion University. It's named in honor of Francis Marion, obviously. Young. It used to be called Francis Marion College, but then years ago it got upgraded to a university. And I'm hopping in again, so while I'm thinking of it, Francis Marion University.
University is actually known by the nickname as the Patriots. So that would also be where the Patriot movie came into play. And she's pointing out that you can still see the university passing by as we're heading on to the next destination. But anyway, they are the Patriots. Okay, so now I'm in Pamplico, South Carolina at another area that has a sign for Francis Marion, but unfortunately this one has completely been destroyed pretty much. But I'll show you what I can of it. So it looks as if somebody has just ransacked this one right here. But you can see a little bit of it still. And it just says, Brigadier Gen General Francis Marion and Major Micaiah Gaining, negotiating an end to the hostiles at Birch's Mill from a 19th century engraving. So, that's all that's left of that one. Okay, so since I couldn't show you that actual sign, I'll just read what the sign said off of the website. I got this information off of. It says, Birch's Mill, South Carolina's first Civil War nears its end. had many characteristics of a civil war with those who supported independence, the Whigs and the Patriots, fighting against neighbors and kinsfolk who remained loyal to the king. Both sides commandeered food, supplies, horses, and livestock from the rural population, while most of the people, black, white, and red, probably just wanted to be left alone. Late in the spring of 1782, with the British military efforts in South Carolina collapsing, get that screen back. I had to do a screenshot on Mom's phone. Okay, so late in the spring of 1782, with the British military efforts in South Carolina collapsing, a treaty between Brigadier General Francis Marion and P.D. Loyalist leader Major Micaiah Ganey was soon to expire. On June 2nd, Marion wrote Ganey that they should come to a new agreement in order to prevent the effusion of blood and distress of the women and children. Marion invited him to meet near here at Birch's Mill, site of a farming settlement, Grits Mill and River Ferry, and a well-known stopping place for Whig, Tory, and British forces alike. On June 8, 1782, after an intense negotiation, Marion and Ganey signed a new treaty in which the loyalists agreed to lay down their arms and return civilian property. So if you can see it right there, that's how it looked before it was destroyed. And all these pictures and information came from hmdb.org so that's what's led me on the path to find all these different things that I'm looking for and obviously I'm not going to find all of them but it's okay better some than none as I like to say okay so I'm going to hop in again the reason we could not find the markers yesterday whenever we were at Snow's Island is because apparently they have been removed whenever I looked on hmdb.org one of the things says they were gone. So the reason they're gone is because somebody took them away. And this is how one of them looks. If it'll show up. Well, now you might only be seeing me. I don't know. Anyway. And then this is how the other one looked. That was the first one right there. 
Okay, so now I'm in Hemingway, South Carolina in a little town called Indian Town. And here's another historical marker about Francis Marion. So this one says Indian Town Presbyterian Church disarm in the most rigid manner. It says after Francis Marion's initial victories in August and early September 1780, British military authorities in South Carolina moved to eliminate the threat of an insurgency in Williamsburg District. Lord Corn Cornwallis ordered Major James Wims to sweep through the area with a large force of British regulars and loyalists, militiamen, and disarm in the most rigid manner all persons who cannot be depended on to support the king. Faced with a much larger force on his, tri on his trail, Colonel Marion had little choice but to retreat into the swamps of eastern North Carolina, but his decision left Williamsburg undefeated. On September 20th, Major Wims reported to Cornwallis that he had burnt and laid waste about 50 houses and plantations, mostly belonging to people who are now in arms against us. According to local lore, Wilms also ordered the burning of Indian Town Presbyterian Church called it a sed sedation shop. Founded in 1757 in the heart of community identity for the rebellious Ulster Scots, or Scots-Irish families of the area, it probably was a center of Whig activity in Williamsburg. The church, a simple log structure on the side of the present building, was rebuilt after the Revolutionary War and again in 1830. So this is how this one right here looks. And then they said that the original church was a little log structure. But as you can tell, there's a beautiful church back there today. I might have to get a little bit closer to it to get a better view of it since the tree is blocking it right now. So that's the modern day church that replaced the one that was burnt all those years ago. And so the sign of the road says Indian Town Presbyterian Church organized in 1757 with John James and Robert Wilson as founding elders burned by the British in 1780 as a sedation shop rebuilt after the revolution present building begun in 1830 remodeled in 1919 major john james revolutionary hero is buried in the churchyard okay so now i have made it to king street south carolina and i am in callahan park could be callahan park however you want to pronounce it but anyway that's where i'm at now so i think i had already spotted the little wayside so we're going to see those are beautiful flowers right there by the way Here is this one. It says, King Street Gathering Vital Intelligence. By late August 1780, Francis Marion and the Whig militiamen of Eastern South Carolina had already begun to cause alarm among the British military leaders in charge of something other the province. This one's really hard to read with all the bird poop on it. Anyway, it says the, the British would move against him. Colonel Marion spent, sent one of his trusted officers, Major John James of the Williamsburg Militia, and a few men back to King Street to gather intelligence. That one's really hard to read out there. Might have to go to the website and read this one. But anyway, this one is in existence still. Okay, so I'm still in King Street, but I think I'm on the outskirts of King Street now. But this says, Lower Bridge, take the low ground. Over three weeks in March 1781, Brigadier General Francis Marion conducted a series of engagements between the Santee River and Georgetown, battling, well, not battling, battering a larger force of British regulars and loyalist militiamen under the command of Colonel John Watson. This series of skirmishes is known as Watson's Chase or the Bridges Campaign. After clashes at 
Waibu Swamp and Mount Hope Swamp, Marion continued moving east along the Santee towards Murray's Ferry, thinking Watson would follow, but Watson turned north and made for the lower bridge over the Black River with King Street just beyond. Marion and his men moved quickly to get to the lower bridge first. When Watson arrived at the high bluffs of the south bank across the river, he found the bridge partially destroyed and Marion's men arrayed against him on the low, swampy ground of the north bank on this side of the river. So where he was at. In most battles, the high ground is the best tactical position, but in this case, when Watson sent his artillery forward, the artillerymen could not lower their guns far enough to hit their opponents below. As Marion's expert rifleman picked off his artillerymen, Watson withdrew to the Witherspoon Plantation nearby. Baffled at the defeat, Watson reportedly said to his unwilling Whig hostess, I have never seen such shooting before in my life. Zoom in on a little bit so you can see that. And that says thwarted by British cannons in previous engagements, Marion used the terrain at Lower Bridge so that McCourty's rifles, a group of expert marksmen from the Williamsburg area, could eliminate Watson's artillerymen. So that's that one. And then over here, if you just walk a little bit up. one of these nice markers right here and it says Battle of Lower Bridge. General Francis Marion and his men defeated the British at this place in March 1781. Advancing from the west and finding the bridge on fire, the enemy rushed the nearby ford, but here they were repulsed by troops led by Major John James, Captain Thomas Potts, and Captain William McCarty, and forced to abandon their plan to invade Williamsburg. And that side right there says the same thing. But anyway, it's a beautiful area out here. And I did just look down here. You can actually see water down there today. Hopefully it's showing up on the video. But you know, you can imagine in your mind all this happening all these years ago before we hit modern day times. And now we just have his legacy to look back on but it's truly wonderful that his legacy is honored in the way that it is to this day. Okay, so I'm going to hop in here. There is a marker in Cordsville, Monk's County area, showing where Francis Marion's born. I've got the picture for that, so I'm going to insert the picture of that after this clip because I think I had already deleted the video because I took that a few weeks ago whenever we were heading to Mepkin Abbey, and I think I deleted the video on that because I didn't going to redo a video of this but anyway that will be here okay so that's going to wrap it up for the francis marion gravesite and all of the places that his legacy still continues and is honored today so I really don't have to do any notes on this one because I think I read all the signs while we were going on and I could not read all the signs because some of them just could not be read and then you also have to forgive my bad pronunciation of a lot of words but <laughs> it is what it is anyway you can find more information about what I showed you on claridonmurals.com and that's c-l-a-r-e-d-o-n-m-u-r-a-l-s.com and that gives you all the information about where all the murals are located in Turbyville, Manon, Paxville, and Somerton. And I have to admit, I did not know that those existed until yesterday whenever I was just looking up information so I could put together this video because I wanted it to be more informative than what the last one I did. And I think I have succeeded. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how you feel about it. But anyway, and the other one that sent me in the location hunting process for all these waste sites and historical markers is hmdb.org that means historical marker database .org. anyway they've got the maps so you can press while you're on the website and it'll take you to the exact location that those waste sites are at and as you can tell 
a few of them are damaged a few of them do not exist and I did not find all of them but as I said earlier some better than none but anyway I hope you enjoyed this video over the last of the course of two days filming it's been a really really what you call it? informative learning some information educational. yes educational as well learning some information I did not know at all footage as well because there are buffalo that roam in South Carolina and they're actually near Francis Marion's burial site but I'm not gonna give the exact location because I don't know if they're on private property or whatever but anyway I pulled off the side of the road and took a video of them so I do hope you're enjoying that because years ago buffalo did roam in South Carolina and I don't know if the deer and the antelope played with them but anyway maybe they did I know we still have deer to this day just everywhere but anyway hope you enjoyed that footage as well and thanks again for watching and you know you can give me a thumbs up if you want to so bye